Okay. Thanks. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for coming here. Um, it's a pleasure for me to announce Florian Hiebler from Arista Networks, which uh, who will give you an update about 400 gigs set R and its future use cases. Stage is yours. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, so yeah, my name is uh, Florian Hiebler. I am the uh, manager of the systems engineering group for Arista in Germany. And what I actually want to talk about is, first of all, where we are with the ZR optics in an optics world. And by now, the optics world can be a bit um, confusing. But uh, instead of just annoying you, I'm just going to talk a little bit about this top left corner, top right corner from your side. Um, optics ZR and ZR Plus. What are those? So. First of all, the ZR and ZR Plus um, optics are for, let's call it medium to wide um, distance services, so anything above 40 kilometers. Um, and let's start with ZR. And particularly, I don't want to talk like hypothetical use cases or something like this here, but real world use cases. Some of my colleagues tested in a real world environment on actual fiber deployed uh, somewhere. When you look for the ZR transceivers, you're going to look for a couple of specifications also on how to run them across your optical, uh, existing optical network, for example. So first of all, you always look in the specifications for the frequency and the grid spacing. Then one thing um, you might spot is that they have right now really, really low launch power. So under 10 dBm, minus 10 dBm. Um, also, another value you want to look for is the optical signal-to-noise ratio the optic can uh, have, which then ensures when you are within this range that you have an error-free signal. And in addition to that, what kind of chromatic dispersation the uh, optic understands or must have as a minimum um, to also ensure that the link is stable. When we talk about optics, we also talk about fiber. Um, this is like the specification of a single mode fiber, OS2. Um, and there you see a couple of very interesting values. You see the um, maximum attenuation you have per kilometer on a different wavelength. And in addition to that, what kind of chromatic dispersation this fiber has. Please note, this is the specification. And keep them in mind for, for later on. I will show you actually the real world, how, how it looks. Um, ideally, you have about 0 0.5, uh, 25 dB per kilometer on attenuation and about uh, 17 picoseconds per nanometer on the chromatic dispersation. Uh, Yes. Florian, kannst du dich auf die andere oh, Seite sorry. stellen? Yeah, um, okay, sorry. Um, but what is chromatic dispersation? If you haven't worked with, net, uh, with, with optical networks so far, it's probably good to understand what those values actually mean. So chromatic dispersation um, happens if you have a signal on Tx inside to, uh, towards a fiber, multiplexed on different wavelengths. Those different wavelengths travel at different speeds. So instead of like a really sharp signal, as you can see on the left side, the signal might actually um, arrive in kind of a flat shape. If that window is too large, um, you have an issue with your signal. In addition to that, you have the optical signal to noise ratio. You always have some noise on the on the um, fiber, so if the noise is too high, um, you cannot really differentiate what's the actual signal and what's the noise. So you will have bit errors on um, uh, yeah on the link. So the uh, fiber, the test fiber, the test build we had was in Istanbul. Um, we had two point-to-point -point connections, one about 40 kilometers, 
one about 80 kilometers. Um, and yeah, please note that this was actually like a real buildup, not some fiber spools we had in the lab. When you configure something like a 400 gig ZR, it is actually pretty cool because it's a tunable transceiver. You just need one kind of transceiver, not what you had back those days in the 10 gig passive DWDM space where you bought a transceiver for channel 30, 32 or something like this. Um, here you configure the frequency on the interface. Um, as you can see at the, uh, at the config snippet below, you configure the frequency inside the, uh, the port settings. So they are um, tunable and therefore also uh, coherent. In uh, the example, we used an amplifier in a transceiver form factor, because remember, the uh, optic itself has a very low launch power. So you, if you build it brownfield, you need a preamp. Or um, this is what Arista has is a point-to-point -point line system. Um, where you have a transceiver in the switch, which is pretty much the, the boost and the preamp. The interesting part is, I skipped, skipped the 40 kilometer one because that's pretty boring, it just works. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the 80 kilometer one is actually the more interesting one. So if you look at the uh, digital optic values, um, there are a couple of very important things to watch for. So first of all, the post fac, um, as I mentioned before, this comes to a bad optical uh, signal to noise ratio. And also you see the chromatic dispersation the optic observes on the link, uh, as well as the configured laser frequency. We had the calculation before, an optical fiber has about 17 picoseconds per nanometer on chromatic dispersation, which equals this link actually slightly above 80 kilometers um, so 81.41 kilometers. Also note that this optic runs fairly hot. The case temperature of this optic is around 60 degrees. It's not actually safe to touch for any data center technician. Um, for the line system we have um, in a transceiver form factor, we can also see that we boost it up quite significantly and we get slightly different values than we would get from a regular optic. So we boost the signal of about, yeah, up to about 20, 20 dBm. Um, ah, well, and one thing here, this is actually an interesting one because my colleague hasn't spotted it when they tested the fiber. Actually, the, uh, on the preamp, we have a warning um, only in one direction, which was also very interesting. So the fiber hasn't been cleaned properly or, or something like this. Um, the link was still up and stable, but obviously this, this would point towards a uh, potential cause of issues. So if you talk about ZR, you also talk about forward error correction. There are two types of error correction uh, effects in, uh, for, for ZR. One is CFAC, one is OFAC, and it pretty much just depends on the amount of attenuation you can compensate with the forward error correction. In our case, we used um, OFAC. And um, if you calculate the loss we saw on the fiber actually down by using the, uh, uh, the optical output values uh, we saw, we actually had a loss of close to 30 dB. We know our fiber is about um, a bit over 80 kilometers, which then already points to a loss in attenuation of 0 0.37 per kilometer, keeping in mind that the ideal spec says 0 0.25. So within a real world example, you're actually way beyond uh, in terms of attenuation than what you should see on just a regular fiber patch cord. Um, just as a brief summary for ZR, um, ZR itself is designed as a point-to-point -point, um, solution only, like no fancy optical networks below or, or above, uh, no dropouts, stuff like this. Um, right now you need preamplification and a booster. Those are available in a transceiver form factor if you want to go down that path. Um, but you can also work with external line systems, but um, you pretty much need to qualify them. Um, and ideally you do this together uh, with your switch vendor and your optical uh, vendor. <laughs> 
The more interesting part is probably the ZR plus. Um, so what is ZR plus? It's a de facto standard for long haul optics. Um, it is achieved by multiplexing four times 100 gig. And it has a potential reach of, it doesn't say here, of around 3,000 kilometers with amplification in between. This is the very, very important part to mention. Um, a very interesting thing for the ZR Plus is also the application modes. So you can take a 400 gig ZR Plus optic and run it in different ways. And I'll show you some examples later. One of the ways is just 400 gig in, 400 gig out, like from an electrical to an optical side, how it is presented to the switch, um, as well as 400 gig on the optical side, but four times 100 gig towards the switch side, which means you pretty much break down the, the lanes like you would do with a breakout cable. So you could give a customer, in theory, their own 100 gig link on a 400 gig optical um, ZR Plus without, doing any, without the needs of any shaping or something like this, like you would give them a wave. Um, why would you use different application modes? Every application mode comes with its own certain link characteristics you need to run them in. So I know this, this looks a bit, um, <laughs> a, a, a bit weird, um, but this is, this is actually fairly important to understand how far you can go. And this also means, you see like um, 14 down here or 13, um, this means you take a 400 gig optic, put it in 100 gig mode, so only 100 gig comes out of it, but you can travel a very, very far distance. Um, here you can actually see, well, um, <laughs> I kind of lied to you with the, with the 3,000 kilometers, because that's in 200 gig. Um, with 100 gig, you could, in theory, go up to 6,000 kilometers of reach, so subsea cable range. Um, what we have we tested this on, actually? We tested it on a Nokia WDM, so we do obviously don't have our own. Um, we used an Arista switch for this. We used uh, ZR Plus optics from Smart Optics, um, which are rebranded Acacia optics in this case. And we tested it on a 40 kilometer link and on a seven, uh, 750 kilometer link. How do you configure it? You configure pretty much the same way like you configure ZR, so you configure a frequency. But then in addition to that, you also configure an application mode. So in this case, we selected application mode 5 because the link was within certain characteristics for the 40 kilometer one. Um, and this was just plain 400 gig mode. The interesting thing here is, and this is something before running this, verify with your switch vendor um, if the port you want to plug the ZR Plus optic in is actually well, meant for ZR Plus, because in our case, we had to apply this transceiver power ignore because the switch itself was only certified for 20 watts um, per optic in that slot. The ZR Plus optic draws, or requests at least, 23.75. We would, as a safety measure, actually disable this optic by default. Um, yeah, so link link came up, um, temperature again around 55 degrees. Uh, we see um, the channel power, we see the total power the optic receives, the estimated OSNR, so we're all within the specifications. And then we also can see up here that we're operating in 400 gig mode. 400 gig is up with eight lanes. And we have Reed Solomon as FEC. Um, enabled. So, looks all good. We could ping across. Um, 40 kilometers is, is fairly easy for a ZR Plus optic. The more interesting one was the 750 kilometer one. So, we changed the application mode to a 300 gig mode. And I know this sounds odd. Um, what then happens is you define a couple of lanes out of those eight. The ones up here, one, three, and five. Those lanes 
will be enabled on the optic itself. Um, and then, yeah, you set the application mode, um, power ignore. And then what happens is the following. The 400 gig optic comes up in 300 gig mode, which means out of those four lanes up here, only three show up as connected, one shows up as non-connected, and the individual 100 gig links, but just three of them for further range, and again, link uh, characteristics. To sum this up, um, what is 400 gig ZR plus? In my opinion, ZR plus for long haul is the future. So when you talk to optical vendors, make sure your uh, optical solution can support ZR plus, can support the grid spacing. Um, right now it comes with a very low optical output power, which means you might need to have a preamp if you want to run it in a brown hole field, uh, environment, just for the ZR optics. Um, this is subject to change. There are more optics uh, coming out with a higher launch power, I think, by the end of this year. Again, I mentioned it also before, not every platform is compatible with a ZR plus optic due to uh, power and thermal constraints. And it's, this, this literally comes from a point where the optic can draw something between 18 and 25 watt. One single optic. I mean, this needs to be cooled and, and all that stuff. Um, but also what we've seen in the field is that this power draw from the optics is really inconsistent. We've seen it extremes on both ends from the same optic vendor. Um, this gets a bit better nowadays as well. But using those transceivers in, uh, in unsupported platforms can actually really damage your switch. And this will be obviously not covered by any warranty. So just be very cautious and, and double check with your um, network vendor. I mentioned before, higher launch power optics are about to come. And they're compatible with most long haul systems as they're deployed right now. Um, although those optics are expected to have even higher power consumption. So we're talking then probably in the 25 watt range rather than in the 20 watt range or 22 watt range. So again, just the, the urgent call out and I mean that's the reason I put it twice on the slide is be really cautious when you look into those systems. Pretty much every vendor out there in the market has switches certified for ZR Plus use cases and will tell you which ports can or can't take ZR Plus optics due to cooling usually. Um, and yeah, for, for the high launch power one, I mean, obviously you need to validate if it's actually working with your, with your long haul system. Um, but I mean, the ones of you who actually operate networks and particularly optical networks um, should be very familiar with this. The good thing is it is a standard, it is interoperable uh, between vendors, it is interoperable usually also between um, well, optical vendors. Um, so it, it, it should just work, um, TM, <laughs> as, as, you, as you all know. Um, that's pretty much from my side. I hope this was interesting to you, um, to give you a bit more of an actual insight of what's happening. And looking forward to a lot of 400 gig ZR and ZR Plus deployments in the future. If you have any questions, find me later on here. I'll be around today and tomorrow. Thank you so much. Thank you, Florian. I think we might have time for one quick question, but otherwise you can find Florian today here or the following days on the internet too. Any questions? There's only one question. It's an online question. Um, for the forward error correction you mentioned, um, how much is there implemented in the ASIC and how much is in the optics? <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, this is actually something I, I would need to look at, uh, need to look up. Um, so FAC usually always have to uh, has to do something with what the ASIC is capable of. 
but also what the optic is. So it's like 50-50, I would say. But uh, for a really exact answer, I, I need to look it up. Um, the person online can just hit me up anytime. And um, yeah, just let me know. Thank you, Florian.